know, it's funny, every generation of human beings thinks that they've observed it all and everything they've done is game changing. And I bet you in the year 2023, we're nowhere close to understanding the human body. In fact, I know we're not. merciful you show yourself merciful with the blameless man you show yourself blameless with the purified you deal purely and with the crooked you make yourself seem torturous that's 2 Samuel 22 26 through 27 good afternoon appreciate the time this is biblical anatomy the biblical anatomy podcast in conjunction with our Wednesday podcast the Discipleship Conditioning Podcast. This is our seventh or eighth episode, I think, uh, every Monday, apart from holidays, and we're excited that you're here. Part of our overall business plan with our academy is to provide anatomy and physiology teachings the way that they should be. They should be taught honoring and glorifying God, our Creator. And if you have the experience I do, you took anatomy and physiology as an undergrad and perhaps graduate student, and you probably never heard God's name mentioned once, which is a complete dishonor to the one who created it all. In fact, you'll hear structures like the Bowman's capsule or the Krebs cycle or whatever it may be. And no disrespect to those scientists who observed that, but they didn't create it. They didn't find it. They observed God's creation. So it's pretty asinine if you ask me that we are naming structures based on human beings when all we did was observe it you know it's funny every generation of human beings thinks that they've observed it all and everything they've done is game changing and i bet you in the year 2023 we're nowhere close to understanding the human body in fact i know we're not you see it in anatomy and physiology textbooks all the time where we pretend to understand the brain or we pretend to understand the lymphatic system. We are so far off from a decent understanding. I mentioned to my students a lot of times in line with this discussion that it's similar to the iceberg effect. Although I don't know that that's appropriate enough, perhaps we need to push the iceberg down a little bit for it to be appropriate. But with the, with the iceberg effect, what you see is what we know but what is underneath the surface is what we don't know. And that's pretty profound to think about. And again, I think that that's probably an okay analogy and a better one if we press down on the iceberg because what we know is horribly inaccurate and horribly underwhelming, to be honest. Coming from someone who has spent the better part of a decade studying biology, specifically anatomy and physiology. I think it's important for those of us that are students in the biological sciences to remain humble and always give credit to our creator. And so at Biblical Anatomy Academy, that's what we aim to do, is provide people with a exceptional educational experience in the biological sciences, specifically anatomy and physiology, but done so properly by honoring God throughout. There will be much more that we will come through over the years, many courses that we will offer all within the biological sciences. Eventually, we want to be able to offer someone an equivalent to an associate's degree. Once we're there, a bachelor's degree, and so on and so forth. In our academy, we are doing just that. We are offering courses and we are creating courses all the time. Most of my week is spent creating courses for the academy. A couple times a week, I get to hop on here and I get to record a podcast. And I'm excited within this Biblical Anatomy and a B- Biblical Anatomy Academy podcast, this Biblical Anatomy podcast, that I get to share some common pitfalls that the average college freshman would have in a traditional anatomy and physiology class. Today we're going to talk about organic and what is organic. You can't get more organic than God creating everything. It's pretty mind-boggling to think of everything that we see, energy and matter, is all from God's initial creation. 
We can't create new things. We can remodel existing things. We can't create energy. We can transfer energy. And so God had to think of all this stuff in the Big Bang or whatever you want to think was the beginning of all time and make sure that everything we needed was covered for however many years he intended us to be around. It's absolutely mind-boggling to, to try and wrap your head around that. Uh, all the laws within physics that we know, all the biological principles that we study, all of that was just a fraction of what was forethought in that instance. And I almost say in that time, but time is really just a construct of our own journey and what how we understand things. God's timeless. God is limitless. He's outside of time. He's outside of limits. The Bible allows us to know him, but not understand him. I'll talk probably a little bit more on Wednesday about knowing God and not fully understanding God as intended. But today we're going to talk about anatomy and physiology, specifically organic as it pertains to anatomy and physiology. As a reminder, our mission is to bring together Christians who seek to understand their biblical anatomy, to connect science with scripture, so we can better understand God's handiwork in our life. The benefit of today, well, you'll have a better understanding of what organic means. Not organic in the world, like the grocery store, but organic as it pertains to your anatomy and physiology. First, we'll tell a little bit of a story about that grocery store. No matter where you live in the United States, there's a solid chance that your local grocery store has an organic section. And what do, what do they mean by that? Well, spoiler alert, they don't mean what we mean when we say organic. What they mean is it followed a set of marketing principles and regulations to be defined as organic. It's no different than the term free range as it pertains to chicken. With chickens, the laws and principles that govern the use of that term of free range only means that you provide a suitable space for the chickens to be free range. They don't even have to accept that and be free range. They could spend their entire lives in the barn and never come outside. That area can be caged, it can be fairly small, but this chicken have the opportunity, even if, even if everything enticing them is actually inside the barn, the fact that you opened the door on a daily basis and gave them access to this space makes them free range. So we have to be really careful when we're in the grocery store of what truly is worth our extra money. Now, of course, nothing's better than coming from your own property and you growing it in your garden or those sorts of things, but most of us are shopping at the grocery store. So just be careful with those terms when you see them because they don't mean what we're going to talk about with organic. And oftentimes they don't mean what you think that they mean. And the difference between them and the non-organic version is probably equally as bad. In fact, when we look further at a grocery store and we look further at bad, you may have heard this before, but it's important to look at the perimeter of the store you'll notice that the perimeter has far more perishable goods than the inside of the store. And this is almost at every grocery store and it's because it's easier to access the perimeter. Perishable things have to be rotated more frequently, right? Non-perishable don't. So you're gonna find your pastas and things of that nature on the shelf in the center of the store because they could remain there for months, maybe even years. The oranges and the milk and those sorts of things are going to be on the perimeter of the store because they need to be recycled and you need to have continual access to them. Just like in a house, when you look at a carpet, you see an area that is more worn than another. You're traveling that path more frequently, so it has to be easily accessible. The path that is less worn down, not as big a need for that room to be as accessible or clutter free or whatever the case is. You get my point. But as we segue into anatomy and physiology and what organic means in that biological realm, it's very simple, but we have to look at it from an elemental standpoint. Over the last few weeks, we've talked about acids. We've talked specifically about hydrogen. And hydrogen comes into play with organic as well. 
So an anatomy and physiology class would define organic as something that contains carbon. I could leave it there and we'd probably be okay most of the time, but to serve you adequately, the best definition is a little bit more than that. An organic compound or molecule has a CC bond or a CH bond. What that means, C stands for carbon, H stands for hydrogen. So if the molecule or compound has a carbon-carbon bond or a carbon-hydrogen bond, it qualifies as organic. And it's literally as simple as that. If it doesn't have that, it's going to be classified as inorganic. I'll give you a couple examples. Carbon dioxide. We would write that out as CO2. It has a carbon, so under that first definition that is adequate most of the time, but here we're providing an example of where it's inadequate, that would be classified as inorganic based on the correct definition, but organic based on the first improper definition. Why is it inorganic? It does have carbon, but it does not have another carbon or a hydrogen element, hydrogen atom. So carbon dioxide, even though it has one carbon, one single carbon, it would be classified as inorganic. What about water? H2O, well it has the hydrogen, but there's no carbon present, and so we would qualify that also as inorganic, and we would further label that as the most, in, most important inorganic compound in our body. It makes up about two-thirds or 67% of our total mass. Very important. So in that way, organic doesn't mean more important than inorganic. It's simply defined based on the molecular structure. So when you're in your anatomy and physiology class and you're talking about organic, easily confused by the organic that the world defines in the grocery store or perhaps other areas, but fairly simple in our world of anatomy and physiology. You have to have a CC bond or a CH bond. So our carbohydrates, our lipids, our proteins, those are all going to have CC bonds or CH bonds, so they would qualify as organic. In fact, when you look at your micronutrients and we look at vitamins and minerals, the only difference really between vitamins and minerals is if they are classified as organic or inorganic. Vitamins would be organic, minerals would be inorganic. So when we look at organic, we really have four categories. We have those vitamins. We also have carbohydrates, we have proteins, and we have lipids. Lipids, I'll speak on second. There's some confusing nuances there as we get into classes. Proteins, I'll speak on third because there's some, also some nuances there that are a little bit difficult to delve into. This will come across a little bit as a nutrition class. It's hard for it not to be when we're talking about these specific biomolecules, these organic biomolecules. Um, and we'll talk about that as appropriate, but we're also gonna define what each is. So we'll start with carbohydrate. Carbohydrate, if we break it apart, there are three elements within a carbohydrate. They are carbon, as you may guess, they are hydrogen, and they are oxygen, CHO for short. So with that, we are going to have basically Legos. And if you think of them as different colors, this in my theory, in my estimation, is why so many different diets out there work. We'll have our carbon Legos, we'll have our hydrogen Legos, and we'll have our oxygen Legos, which as we're going to see with lipids and proteins, those Legos exist there. So we can deconstruct them and rearrange them in the way that is most fitted for us. In fact, an example of where we have that rearrangement is actually with your respiratory rate and the food that you eat. We all know that we bring oxygen in from the exterior, from the atmosphere. That is driven by atmospheric pressure. We'll talk much more about that when we get to the respiratory system, but for now, where does that oxygen go? Well, into our lungs, into our bloodstream, circulates throughout the cardiovascular system, and eventually ends up at a oxygen-hungry tissue that needs it. And so, it uses that oxygen. It would make sense to think that that oxygen is then bound to a carbon to make carbon dioxide, and then the reverse happens. But it's actually not what happens. What usually happens is that eventually is bound with hydrogen to form water. And we either maintain the water and recycle it in our bodies, or if we're adequately hydrated, we expel it through perspiration, respiration, or urination. So where do we get the carbon dioxide? Well, 
Most of our foods supply that. Um, really all of our foods do because they all have carbon present. We'll use carbohydrates as an example, CHO, remember? So we're going to digest that and we're going to take that glucose to the cells that need it. And when we need the energy, we're going to break all that apart in a process known as glycolysis or the citric acid cycle, which to tie a term that we had before used to previously be called the Krebs cycle. And by doing that, breaking those Legos apart, if you will, we will have the free carbons that we need to bind with oxygen, and then we will expel that. So that would go out of the tissue, into your blood system, back through your heart to your lungs and be expelled outward. So oxygen is coming in, carbon dioxide is coming out, but the carbon dioxide that comes out is not from the oxygen that came in. We have to incorporate our exchange into water and our exchange of the nutrients that we ingest from digestion and from our nutrition. Next we have lipids. Lipids are quite a bit more complicated than carbohydrates because there are classes. Carbohydrates, either you have a, a simple sugar or a complex sugar. Uh, more scientifically, you'd have a monosaccharide, a disaccharide, and a polysaccharide. Lipids, you're going to have categories like individual families. And those families are steroids, phospholipids, and triglycerides. Triglycerides is what most of us think because we think of the consumable fats that we ingest with our nutrition. Those are triglyceride based. Steroids, often misconfused with anabolic steroids, are essential for us to formulate a lot of the hormones that we have. They also interact a very specific way with cells, which I believe I may have mentioned in one of the previous podcast episodes, in that steroids can go directly through the phospholipid bilayer of cells and impact differently than non-steroid, generally the protein type, can. We then have that category, that second one, which was indirectly mentioned just a few seconds ago, of phospholipids. And with phospholipids, they are unique because we can utilize them with their lipid nature and their phosphorus nature to design a cell membrane, and for that matter, a nuclear envelope or a nuclear membrane for the nucleus of a cell. They uniquely divide environments, intracellular from extracellular, or intranuclear from extranuclear they are perfect for that role and so also essential hormones are essential phospholipids are essential so when we think about triglycerides and how much we should be consuming and rearranging those lego blocks a lot of times particularly when i was a kid in the 80s and the 90s you heard everywhere that fats are bad can't have fats especially trans fats and i won't argue that trans fats are bad they certainly are but to say that we don't need fats completely would be not serving the population well. Clearly we need steroids. Clearly we need phospholipids. So the triglycerides and the rearrangement we can make to maintain those steroids and phospholipids is essential. If you go on a zero fat diet, it's probably not gonna work out well. Just the same as you go on a zero carbohydrate diet, probably not gonna work out well. Now I'm gonna get more pushback there because of the current fad of carbs are the enemy in the ketogenic diet. But you'd be amazed at what happens when you eliminate sugar, but you do not eliminate carbs. I personally don't even feel the need to eliminate sugar completely. I grew up at grandma's dining room table. There was a cup of sugar in the middle, and we all mixed that with our tea. Admittedly so, I also put it on my Rice Krispies as well, which grandma wasn't looking when I did that. But everything in moderation, right? I don't do that currently as an adult, but I certainly have sugar in the house. If you want to take that to an extreme, you can simply say no sugar whatsoever, but no sugar does not mean no carbohydrates. Any of these three macronutrients that are organic should not be completely voided in one's diet at all. I, I don't believe that to be uh, servicing to the individual. So. Even in a true ketogenic diet, you're still consuming carbs. You're just, like many other diets, trying to do your best to eliminate the simple sugars, those sugars. And while sugar can be synonymous with carbohydrate, it's more accurately synonymous with a monosaccharide. So if you want to stay away from the simple sugars or the monosaccharides, that makes sense. Maybe even makes a lot of sense. But to completely eliminate carbs or lipids or proteins, would be a bad idea. Proteins, 
their Legos, if you will, are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, sound familiar, also nitrogen, and sometimes even occasionally sulfur. But if we have the building blocks of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, there's a lot that we can do with diets, right? So if you want to go zero carbs, are you going to die? Well, you're not going to be well or as well as you could be, but you're still getting your carbons, your hydrogens, and your oxygens from your lipids and your proteins. So can you mix those around and make do? Well, that's where ketone bodies and the condition of ketosis comes from, which are essentially fake carbohydrates. So the body is not in the business of just giving up and dying. It's going to utilize whatever you give it. Now, is that utilization optimal? I would argue no, but that's why so many different diets work. Now, if we continue the cyclical pattern of the 80s and 90s that fats are bad, and now in the 2000s and 2010s and even 2020s, carbohydrates are bad, one might predict that in the 2020s, 2030s, 2040s, that protein will be bad. If that happens, it'll get a big eye roll from me because proteins are the most essential of all of them. While oftentimes you only need 15% of your diet to be protein-based, it's not going to work if you eliminate it completely. And I'll sum it up pretty simply. If I were to reach out to your screen, whatever device you're on, and point out a letter that's on your screen from the name of the podcast or whatever, let's just say that's the size of a carbohydrate. If we were to compare that to a lipid, we could say the size of the device that you're on would be the size of the lipid. Pretty substantial difference from size of carbohydrate to lipid. Carbohydrate's often going to be a six carbon molecule for the monosaccharides. And each individual chain of a fatty acid chain, note there are three within a triglyceride, hence the tri, uh, is an 18-ish carbon chain. So each chain is three times as big and multiply that by three and then include the glycerol backbone there's a substantial difference in size there. Quite a few times bigger. If you're on an iPad or something, maybe not quite to that extent, but a smaller phone, yeah, that's reasonable. Going beyond that, we have proteins. Whatever building you're in, whether it's a house or a high-rise building, would be comparable in size to everything that we've mentioned to a protein. Why can I say that if you're in a house versus in a high-rise building? Well, because proteins vary, and you can simply stack more and more and more. Enzyme proteins are going to be smaller than structural proteins, oftentimes. Uh, why enzyme proteins have to maneuver through the blood system, whereas structural proteins make up muscle, they make up bone, they make up neurons, they make up all sorts of stuff. So, all that to say, if you eliminate dietary proteins... It's going to be really difficult to manufacture proteins, create fake proteins, if you will, from the lipids and the carbohydrates because you're going to have to go through anabolic processes to build those Legos up. Whereas if you eliminate lipids or carbs, as has been done over the last 30, 40 years with a lot of people, you still have the biggest. You have the house. You have the high rise. You can break that up and make fake carbs and I suppose you can make fake lipids as well. I'm not as well versed on what happens when you eliminate lipids from your diet because I was a kid when that happened and I haven't gone back and researched that. But nevertheless, again, to restate, if you eliminate any of these three, you're going to have problems or at least be suboptimal. Now, again, that could reach uh, a lot of pushback with people that are against carbohydrates and things of that nature. But I think where we would find common ground is the sugar, the true monosaccharides the true sugars. I would be all for eliminating sugars. Now again, I don't personally, but I can see the logic in that. Now eliminating carbohydrates completely, I do not see the logic in that. Eliminating lipids completely, I certainly don't see the logic in that. And eliminating proteins completely, that's absolutely comical. I hope you've been able to yield something from our biomolecule, our organic biomolecule discussion. We will be able to dive into more depth when we get to the nutrition section, uh, but use this as a reference to go back and forth as you climb your way through anatomy and physiology. As a reminder, we are self-sponsored, so we've got our two podcasts. Those are all produced through the same hosting site, and they appear through biblicalanatomy.com. We have a number of domains that will take you to the same place, but the easiest, quickest one is biblicalanatomy.com. There'll be a tab for podcasts. You can click on that and see both podcasts 
and you can find out how to access that through whatever podcast player you have. Uh, If you're listening to it now, you're listening to it through the website or you're listening to it through a form of social media or you've found that route already. I mention that because it would be helpful for us if you could recommend the podcast to someone in your life. If you could spread the message and if at the least, if you can't do that, we would appreciate a review. Tips and referrals, uh, in addition to referrals, are also essential for us. We have a pretty massive upgrade of equipment, including a new microphone and stand, uh, coming our way in a matter of weeks. Uh, To help with funding that, tips are strongly appreciated for that. There are links in the show notes at the very bottom if you want to support in that way. And then lastly, consider attending one of our biblical anatomy courses, or if to you, you are busy doing other things and maybe that's not as big of interest to you or pressing need for you, you probably have someone in your circle of influence that is a college freshman or maybe is in high school working their way up and would be interested in the things that we have to offer. We're not going anywhere. We're going to be here for a long time. Maybe one day the podcast doesn't exist, but the Academy will. So please consider us when you and your family members are considering alternatives to education. And I've spoke on that before. I think we're about to see a seismic shift and exodus, if you will, of people running from the traditional education model. And we plan to be ready for those individuals who still want to know about their biological science, sciences, their bodies, but specifically the correct way biblically. So we'll be here. Please keep us in mind. So our take home message, the organic world confusion and the negative connotation associated with your local grocery store is significantly different and significantly inappropriate to how we would define it in anatomy and physiology. And for a college freshman, this can be a stumper on a test because you're going to get to a place where they're going to ask you what defines organic. And as we defined it, CC bond or CH bond is very different than how the world defines it. But in anatomy and physiology, we're used to that, right? When you heard your lesson on acids and bases, you probably didn't hear God mention it. And so we continue to provide an outlet here, a take-home message for you on a weekly basis that you can feel good about. Let's conclude as we always do with the Lord's Prayer. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen.